Thank you for joining us today to hear from this year's recipient of the Edith and Peter O'Donnell Award in Science. I'm Christine McCoy, the Director of Development at TAMIST, the Academy of Medicine, Engineering, and Science of Texas. Before we begin our session today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our organization. TAMA supports collaboration to advance research, innovation, human talent development, and business in Texas. We're composed of more than 320 Texas-based members of the three national academies, the National Academy of Medicine, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Sciences, and the state's 11 Nobel laureates. TAMIS is supported by the founders of our endowment and by our 18 academic and medical research member institutions. We wanna recognize all of them today for their ongoing contributions to our research community and to the health and vitality of our state. Today's session is the third of four, highlighting the research of this year's recipients of the Edith and Peter O'Donnell Awards. These awards play a vital role in recognizing and promoting rising star researchers in the state. The awards are named in honor of Edith and Peter O'Donnell, who have been steadfast supporters of TAMIS since its inception and incredible advocates for excellence in education and research. The awards are supported through the O'Donnell Endowment, and we'd like to acknowledge and thank the O'Donnell Endowment donors and O'Donnell Foundation for their generous contributions to the awards program. The O'Donnell Awards Selection Committee is composed of 12 TAMIS members serving on four committees, one committee for each award, plus the committee chair. We'd like to recognize the 2021 Awards Committee chaired by Mr. Kenneth Arnold, for their hard work evaluating the outstanding candidates over this past year. We'd also like to thank all of the Nobel Laureate Committee members who reviewed the finalists for the awards. Today's session will feature a 20 minute presentation from the recipient of the Science Award, Dr. Benjamin Tu. After Dr. Tu concludes his presentation, we'll have time for audience questions. Attendees have the option to type a question or comment through the Q&A function. You can ask your question using the Q&A box at any time during the presentation or Q&A segment itself. I'd now like to introduce our moderator for today's session, Dr. David Russell. Dr. Russell is the Vice Provost, Dean of Basic Research, the Eugene McDermott Distinguished Chair in Molecular Genetics and Professor of Biophysics and Molecular Genetics at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Dr. Russell is a TAMIS member and also served on the 2021 O'Donnell Awards Committee as the Science Subcommittee Chair. Dr. Russell, thank you for your service to TAMIS and for moderating today's session. We'll now turn it over to you. Thank you, Christine, and good morning. As Chair of the O'Donnell Awards Science Committee, and on behalf of my fellow committee members, Dr. Bonnie Bartell of Rice University and Dr. Marcetta Derensborg of Texas A&M University, it's my honor to introduce to you the winner of the 2021 O'Donnell Science Prize, Dr. Benjamin Tu. Dr. Tu grew up in Pennsylvania and attended Harvard University for his undergraduate education. He then traveled west for his um, graduate training at the University of California, San Francisco, where he worked with Dr. Jonathan Weissman in the area of protein folding. Dr. Tu finished his PhD in 2003 and migrated halfway across the country to do his postdoctoral training in Dallas, Texas with Dr. Stephen McKnight at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. There, Dr. Tu developed an interest in intermediary metabolism and how yeast and other cells change their metabolism to accomplish fundamental aspects of life, such as growth, maintenance, and replication. He continued this interest after joining the UT Southwestern faculty in 2007, and today he is considered to be one of the world's experts in how both normal and disease cells respond to their environment. This morning, Dr. Tu will describe his research to us that led to his receiving the 2021 O'Donnell Science Prize from TAMIST. Ben, the floor is yours. All right, can everyone uh, see, see the, the slides? All right, thank you very much, uh, David, for that uh, kind introduction. I wanna thank uh, Terrence and Christine uh, for their accommodation of an extra week and 
I hope those of you affected by the free storm are, are on your way to getting back to normal. Uh, and I want to uh, start by saying that, you know, as, as David mentioned, you know, my lab is generally interested in understanding how a variety of cellular processes are coordinated with metabolism and metabolic state. Kind of how we got interested in this uh, started with the curiosity regarding uh, yeast oscillations. And so uh, for decades, uh, the beer brewing industry has uh, observed that uh, budding yeast cells, when you grow them in a fermenter or chemostat, can exhibit these uh, robust oscillations uh, in oxygen consumption, as you can see here. And so a chemostat is a device that's shown here, and it basically allows you to maintain continuous uh, steady state growth conditions. So you can keep variables like pH, aeration, nutrient levels uh, essentially constant. And so you can really slow down the growth of a population of cells and it makes it easier to observe aspects of their growth and behavior. And you can see that, you know, when you do this, uh, you know, these, this cell population really exhibits these remarkable oscillations in oxygen consumption. So we were initially curious whether any genes might be periodically expressed as a function of these uh, oscillations in oxygen consumption. And so shown here are the profiles of yeast genes uh, across uh, three consecutive cycles. And hopefully you can see that, you know, there are many genes uh, that are going up and down with different genes peaking at different times. And, you know, we uh, uh, determined that over half of yeast genes were actually being periodically expressed. And many of these had functions associated with metabolism. So we decided to call these uh, metabolic cycles. And so by studying uh, clusters of genes and when they might peak, uh, we were curious about a, a group of genes that peaked kind of in the middle of this burst of oxygen consumption. And we noted that all of these genes important for cell growth tended to be induced during this burst of oxygen consumption. So here are three of those genes uh, as an example, shown here to the right. And Basically, any gene involved in ribosome biogenesis, uh, rRNA processing, translation, amino acid synthesis, these genes all tended to peak during this window. And another cl cluster that drew our attention are these genes that peak during this blue window. And these are genes involved in stress and survival associated responses. So shown here are three of those genes. And these genes tended to have functions associated with uh, a heat shock response, ubiquitin proteasome, autophagy, vacuole of various detoxification enzymes. And what was interesting was that these growth promoting genes you can see and these survival genes are very strongly uh, reciprocally regulated. So when these growth promoting genes are, are uh, on, these uh, survival genes are off. And conversely, when these survival genes are on, these growth promoting genes uh, are off. And so there's more than a thousand of these growth promoting genes and over 1500 of these uh, stress survival genes. And so we became interested in trying to understand what was the trigger uh, for their expression. And so there's been a lot of interest in these growth promoting genes because you know, they could be important for cancer. And likewise, there's been a lot of interest in these stress and survival genes because they've been linked to longevity and increased lifespan. So we're very curious, you know, how do these genes get turned on precisely during these windows. And is there a common transcription factor or a set of transcription factors that, that could explain this response? And so to get at this, uh, we initially developed uh, methods to quantitate a whole bunch of common metabolites you would find in a cell. So seeing these very robust oscillations in oxygen consumption uh, made us hypothesize that there would be uh, very dramatic changes in, in metabolism in the metabolic state. And so one of the, the first metabolites I added to this library was actually um, acetyl-CoA. And we observed that uh, levels of acetyl-CoA increase very significantly precisely during this oxygen consumption phase when those uh, growth promoting genes were uh, induced. And so this sort of uh, led us to wonder if somehow this metabolite could be linked to the expression uh, of those genes. And on the surface, you could imagine this could be quite sensible because this is such an important intermediate in metabolism. Um, Acetyl-CoA not only feeds into the TCA cycle to help cells make ATP, but it's also an important building block by which cells stitch together 
important metabolites like fatty acids and sterols. And so I became curious how this could be a signal. And there's one more important thing that acetyl-CoA is important for, and it is the acetyl donor for these acetylation modifications that happen on, on proteins. And so this got us uh, curious about uh, histone acetylation and whether histone acetylation amounts might change across these metabolic cycles. And so we did a very simple experiment and looked at amounts of various uh, histone acetylation modifications uh, at different time points. And hopefully you can see that all of these acetyl modifications on the histones that have been linked to uh, gene activation, they really increase very profoundly, uh, specifically during this oxygen consumption phase when levels of acetyl-CoA increase and when those uh, growth promoting genes are, are turned on. And so this was really quite an astonishing result and made us wonder, you know, is, are these histones uh, throughout the entire genome or are these histones acetylated at specific uh, genes? And so we did a, a ChIP-seq experiment to ask, you know, where are these acetylated histones? And we sampled at pretty high temporal resolution. And here are six of those pr growth promoting genes. And hopefully what you can see is that acetylated histones emerge precisely during that uh, temporal window when uh, levels of acetyl-CoA increase. And here are the mRNA profiles of these six genes. And you can see they are all uh, uh, spike and increase during that oxygen consumption phase. And so this was a very exciting result and suggested that maybe acetyl-CoA, this metabolite, was actually the trigger for all of these genes important uh, for uh, cell growth. And at the time, uh, it was very hard for a lot of folks to believe that a metabolite could have such an important role in gene regulation, because uh, I think many of us learned uh, in our classes, and certainly I did in graduate school, that usually the way a gene is turned on is you have a transcription factor that then recruits a co-activator, which may have uh, chromatin modifying activities such as histone acetyltransferase activity, and only then can the gene uh, be turned on. But what we observed was that this metabolite acetyl-CoA might have an equally important role in enabling uh, all of this to happen. So essentially an acetyl-CoA could be rate limiting for the ability of certain histones to be acetylated and then turn on genes at, at these regions. And I think our findings really help spark interest uh, in the intimate connections between uh, epigenetics uh, and uh, metabolism. And so, so next, uh, we became curious, well, what happens? Uh, so I told you about these uh, uh, acetylated histones at the growth promoting genes. Well, now what happens during that survival phase when levels of acetyl-CoA uh, are low? Uh, as I mentioned, there's over 1,500 genes that get turned on during this window. So, so where are the acetylated histones going? Are they important for anything at all? And so we devised a sort of a, a batch culture method to study what happens uh, in response to glucose starvation. And the results were really quite striking. And we noticed that there are very special genes that acquire histone acetylation when levels of acetyl-CoA are low. So for example, this is a gene involved in fatty acid oxidation. And you can see upon glucose starvation, a nice peak of histone acetylation that coincides nicely with emergence of the RNA. And it was not only fatty acid oxidation genes, but key genes involved in, for example, gluconeogenesis. Again, a peak of acetylation emerging during starvation that matches nicely with the appearance uh, of the RNA. And so this was really uh, quite neat and suggests that any remaining acetylation is focused to arguably the most important genes that a cell has to turn on to survive uh, carbon starvation. And so what uh, this series of experiments told us is that to really fully understand histone acetylation, one has to think about the metabolic state. So what happens when the substrate is abundant? So I told you we can see the acetylated histones uh, occurring at these growth promoting genes. But then at the same time, you got to think about what happens when the substrate is really low or limiting. And we see now the remaining histone acetylation is now focused to these genes involved in oxidative uh, energy metabolism. So somehow uh, the cells are sort of focusing any remaining acetyl groups to these really special genes that are, that are absolutely critical for surviving uh, carbon starvation. 
And seeing the importance of acetyl CoA uh, for, for yeast cells made us wonder, well, what about mammalian cells or in particular cancer cells? And at the time, there was a lot of interest in, in cancer metabolism. And many of you know that uh, cancer cells have been observed to be highly glycolytic. And you may be familiar with this uh, Warburg effect, wherein a lot of uh, cancers uh, preferentially convert glucose to pyruvate and then pyruvate over to lactate uh, instead of acetyl-CoA. And so this was a bit of a conundrum for us because you know, seeing how important acetyl-CoA was for yeast made us wonder, well, if all of this uh, glucose is being diverted to lactate in cancer cells, how are they getting uh, enough acetyl-CoA? And this made us suspect that there could be alternative sources of acetyl-CoA for a cancer cell. And at the time, uh, we didn't know any better than to look at how a yeast cell uh, makes acetyl-CoA. And yeast cells do so by uh, uh, converting acetate to acetyl-CoA. And so there are these acetyl-CoA synthetase enzymes that have the ability to convert acetate to acetyl-CoA in the ATP-dependent reaction. And these enzymes are conserved from yeast uh, to mammals. Uh, we have them, uh, but their uh, roles in the million cells and organisms are much less well understood. And we were fortunate uh, that our uh, colleagues upstairs in molecular genetics actually uh, had made a knockout mouse uh, lacking one of these acetyl-CoA synthetase enzymes. And these mice are actually uh, pretty normal. They don't have any obvious phenotype under normal conditions, but we decided to sort of cross them into a couple uh, of mouse models of cancer. And we first started uh, with the liver cancer model. And hopefully you can see this is a model where we basically turn on a very potent oncogene. And you can see mice that have the enzyme uh, after uh, six weeks, you can see their livers look like this. They're just full of tumors. And we were excited to see that uh, in mice lacking the enzyme, you can see quite a few of them have a much uh, lower tumor burden. So this is an example of a liver that would score as a five. You can see quite a significant improvement. Uh, more recently, we've come interested in, in pancreatic cancer. And so we Cross the knockout mice now into a mouse model of uh, pancreatic cancer. And here again, uh, we basically excise the pancreas after eight weeks. And you can see again, uh, for mice that don't have this enzyme, uh, they tend to exhibit uh, lower uh, tumor burdens. And so this sort of sounds, you know, a little bit too good to be true. You have a, a, a non-essential enzyme and, and the knockout mice get uh, fewer tumors. So how, how could this be? And so we decided to now, you know, challenge these mice with uh, a extreme diet. So we would give them either a high fat diet or uh, we would starve them. And curiously, uh, we observed on a high fat diet, uh, you can see that the knockout mice gain much less weight over time compared to uh, wild type and the heads. And when we sat these mice, we saw that uh, you know, as, my, as you might expect for a normal mouse, uh, upon uh, feeding them a high fat diet, their livers get very fatty. As you can see, the accumulation of lipid droplets and the oil red of staining. So interestingly, for many of the knockout mice, their livers look much better. So they were not accumulating fat as a, a normal liver would. And uh, under starvation conditions, we observed that the knockout mice actually did really, really poorly. They were they were very stressed and I think they were on the verge of dying. And, and I don't have time to, to go into it, but we think that basically the knockouts have a problem turning on genes involved in uh, fat metabolism through a mechanism that I described to you earlier uh, that we observed in the yeast system. But now we saw an opportunity, you know, we, we have an enzyme, you know, it's, it's non-essential, it should be druggable and while we were studying the pancreatic cancer model, we observed that these panins, which are these precancerous lesions that are thought to eventually develop into tumors, expressed uh, striking amounts of this acetyl-CoA synthetase enzyme. And you could imagine if we had an inhibitor, uh, we might be able to administer this, in this inhibitor and potentially block these panins and prevent them from becoming uh, tumors. And similarly, uh, as I told you, the knockouts uh, don't get fatty liver. So we're interested in the possibility of giving an inhibitor of this enzyme uh, 
uh, to see if we can reverse uh, fatty liver disease. And so we've actually screened for inhibitors uh, and we hope to, to give them to mice uh, in these contexts to see whether inhibition of this uh, enzyme could have some therapeutic benefit uh, in these models. Uh, sort of uh, in parallel, uh, uh, my lab uh, discovered that um, if you grow yeast in sort of respiratory conditions where you really force them to use their mitochondria, if you grow them in uh, these rich uh, respiratory conditions where there are sort of free amino acids supplemented to these cells, and you switch them to a minimal media that lacks any free amino acids, they actually turn on uh, autophagy. And so you can see here, this is a mitochondrial RFP uh, reporter. And upon switch to this minimal media, you can see this reporter now accumulating uh, in the vacuole, indicative of autophagy happening. And since this minimal media lacks uh, any free amino acids, we could readily add back amino acids one by one to ask you know, which one uh, or ones are, are deficient. And we quickly determined that it was really uh, methionine that was deficient. So just by uh, adding methionine to cells in this minimal media, we could sort of block this induction of autophagy. And we subsequently induced that the way methionine was working was by boosting levels of a downstream metabolite called uh, SAM or s methionine. And this uh, is the biological methyl donor. And so we, we became interested in the possibility that certain biological methylation modifications might be tuned to the level of SAM, just like I showed you for acetylation modifications being tuned to the level of uh, acetyl-CoA. And I'll just quickly tell you about uh, one example of how this works from some of our uh, most recent data. And so uh, ribosomes, uh, actually have uh, two adenosines uh, in the 18S ribosomal RNA. So these two adenosines are located near the very three prime end of the 18S ribosomal RNA. And it's thought that these two adenosines are close to the ribosome uh, decoding site. And these uh, adenosines are known to be sort of uh, dimethylated. And uh, I think people in the field think that these adenosines are constitutively dimethylated. And we discovered that uh, actually a very small proportion of ribosomes actually have just one methyl group uh, instead of two. So about 3%. And quite interestingly, if you starve cells of methionine, the amount of ribosomes with uh, a single methyl group at these A's goes up about uh, three to five fold. And so this was quite uh, intriguing and through a series of experiments to ask, uh, you know, what is the function of these ribosomes with a single methyl group? we observed that they seem to have a, a role in regulating the translation of a special set of mRNAs that are involved uh, in sulfur metabolism. So out of 6,000 or so possible transcripts, we observed about 16, only 16 that were changed in, uh, in a mutant that expresses predominantly ribosomes with one methyl group. And so this suggests that uh, uh, cells make these ribosomes to help them adapt somehow to this uh, sulfur or methionine starvation. And I think it's a cool example of how the ribosome itself can be regulated by uh, metabolic state. So sort of what I've told you is that our, our research has led us to discover what we think are two very important sentinels of the cellular metabolic state, acetyl-CoA uh, and SAM. And you look carefully at what these molecules are, uh, Acetyl-CoA is essentially a carrier of two carbon units, while SAM is a carrier of one carbon unit. And they really represent uh, the metabolic currency of the cell. And I think cells are carefully monitoring their availability. So when they are plentiful, I think cells think they are okay. They can grow or divide, or they can do the things that they need to do. However, if their levels plummet, you can imagine uh, cells will now sense they're in trouble and they have to now uh, engage various survival mechanisms or else uh, they may die or they may experience mutagenic uh, consequences. And lastly, I'll end with this slide here. Uh, this is a, a slide depicting uh, the central dogma of uh, molecular biology. And uh, you know, we all tend to have our favorite gene or protein or RNA, but let's not forget that these these proteins, they do, they do metabolism. And there's these small molecule metabolites 
they, they are not inert, but they in fact carry information about the metabolic state. And I think what we and others have started to observe is that they actually feed back to regulate what genes, RNAs, and proteins uh, actually do. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, when uh, levels of, for example, methionine and SAM are low, uh, this causes cells to make new ribosomes that have one methyl group, and this will change uh, how the ribosome works. We also have recently observed that uh, there's a methyl mark that's been thought to be constitutive on mRNAs, but it's not always there upon uh, methionine starvation or SAM starvation. And you can imagine this might change the fate of these RNAs. And then uh, for uh, histone methylation, so under conditions of SAM starvation, you can imagine bulk levels of histone methylation decrease, but we've observed that they're actually enriched at special uh, regions of the genome. And you can imagine also under these conditions of severe nutritional stress, there still have to be some proteins that have to be made to enable cells to sort of cope with the stress. And perhaps the cells will make use of certain compartments uh, or granules, for example. And an example of this is shown here in the green dots to help uh, make this happen. And so I would argue that our findings really suggest that to, to truly understand uh, the functional purpose of any methylation modification, you really need to think about uh, its links to methionine uh, and SAM. And so we're really excited about deciphering these survival mechanisms. And uh, I believe that they will be the key to understanding the underlying basis of particular cancers or uh, neurodegenerative conditions. Uh, so uh, let me stop there. Uh, I need to first, of course, uh, thank uh, my lab. Uh, here are pictures of the lab uh, over the years. Uh, now, many of them have shown a lot of resilience. Uh, we tend to find new things, uh, and they're initially met with a lot of skepticism, especially by experts in the, in the fields that we wander into. So I really want to thank them for their hard work and for believing in my vision and philosophy. Uh, and many folks, uh, not only in our department, as well as UT Southwestern in general, have really helped us. Uh, and, you know, I, I started out uh, working on a yeast system, but, you know, it's really uh, been great to be able to collaborate with others and this enabled us to get into mammalian systems as well as various uh, cancer models. Uh, I need to thank actually my former mentor, uh, Jonathan, for helping us with some of the, the ribosome work I talked to. Of course, I really need to thank these uh, various uh, funding agencies that have generously supported our work uh, over the years. And lastly, I want to thank uh, the Tamas and O'Donnell Foundation for this wonderful recognition. And thank you all uh, for your attention. And I'll be uh, happy to take any questions. If you have a question, you can, just as a reminder, you can ask it in the Q&A box, which is down at the bottom ribbon of the Zoom. Thank you, Ben. Um, I'll do the honors of looking through the questions and answers that are posted on the, um, in the chat box and then um, pose these questions to you. So Dr. Laura Lavery, who um, is at Baylor College of Medicine, um, complimented you on a great talk and asked the question of whether or not there are data and or hypothesis um, that explain how the 18S ribosomal RNA methylation is creating specificity or, or um, generating specificity to sulfur metabolism messenger RNAs. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we don't know the answer yet, but uh, what I can say is that, um, you know, it's, it's really, uh, the, the result was really quite striking because when we did these ribosome profiling experiments to ask, you know, which transcripts exhibit uh, altered translational efficiency, uh, we, out of 6,000, we really only got 16. And of the 16, 12 were involved in sulfur metabolism. So we've looked sort of in the, in the five prime UTR, three prime UTR, um, nothing obvious jumps out, but if you even look at the 12, uh, transcripts that are affected, uh, you know, it's not all sulfur metabolism transcripts, but they, these 12 tend to be involved in sort of the, uh, the transport of sulfur sources and the more energetically costly steps of sulfur metabolism. So it tells us that this is really a very important regulatory mechanism. And, you know, we don't fully understand it yet, but we hope to 
to figure it out uh, uh, in, the, in the future. I'll take the liberty of asking uh, a question myself, if you don't mind. So you described for us studies on acetyl-CoA, uh, the uh, two-carbon building block that some people have called the busiest molecule in all of metabolism. Um, and you told us how acetyl-CoA is linked to chromosomes and uh, DNA in the acetylation of histones. Is there an order um, to which the histones are acetylated? Like, is it one histone? gets acetylated first and another one second, or is there a temporal regulation, I guess I'm asking? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so no, that's a good question. So, you know, sort of a, in, in our experiments so far, we've observed that at least the marks on uh, histone H3, so there are a couple of lysines on H3 that seem to be uh, uh, the most critical and that they seem to be getting the acyl groups first. And uh, in terms of whether any of these lysines are more important than others, uh, as far as we can tell in these chemostat experiments where the cells are so uh, synchronized, they all seem to emerge sort of uh, concurrently. But what is interesting is I can tell you that, you know, um, despite all those growth promoting genes peaking in that oxygen consumption phase, you can still sort of temporally segregate certain transcripts peak before others. And so for example, all these genes that are important for ribosome biogenesis, they peak maybe five to 10 minutes before the subunits of the ribosome uh, itself. So, uh, but again, when you look at the chromatin, the histones uh, emerge sort of, at least as far as we can tell at the same time. But we think there's, for example, uh, so a lot of these ribosomal subunit RNAs have to be spliced. And so maybe that's an additional sort of quality control mechanism that's sort of temporally ordered in a just-in-time way to help cells optimize this process. Well, coming from the chat room, Dr. Ann Salomon asks um, or points out that what you found in terms of metabolites influencing DNA and RNA synthesis um, is very similar to what happens in chemical reaction equilibria. Have you attempted to maybe model your findings uh, based on you know, what we learned in thermodynamics and physical chemistry in terms of reaction equilibria? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a very good question. Um, at least for uh, acetylation, um, you know, I think it's quite interesting because you know, folks have observed over the years that the, the half-life of an acetyl mark on a histone is actually very short. Uh, it can be on the order of minutes. And so you can imagine that acetylation and deacetylation are constantly in competition. And you kind of, you could flip the switch uh, very quickly by, you know, either spike an acetyl CoA or when levels fall, then deacetylation takes over. And I think this makes a lot of sense because for a yeast cell with a, a, a doubling time of 90 minutes, uh, you know, as soon as you take away glucose, you know, within minutes, you've got these growth promoting genes, they're repressed, right? So they have to very quickly respond. And I, I think you could potentially think about it as a competition between acetylation and deacetylation uh, in terms of who, who, who wins and what uh, uh, gene expression program gets turned on. Um, so from your studies with acetyl-CoA in tumor cells um, and dietary effects thereof, it would seem that ACS2 is a prime target for drug development. Are there projects involving um, I, you know, identifying inhibitors of that enzyme? Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, we, uh, in collaboration with Steve McKnight, uh, many years ago, we uh, performed a small molecule screen uh, for inhibitors of uh, this uh, acetyl-CoA synthetase enzyme. And so uh, these inhibitors uh, were uh, made better by a, a company uh, called Peloton Therapeutics. And so I think they're at the stage where we can use them in mice. And so we've got one that we're trying to now use in a series of experiments now to test whether there could be efficacy in uh, preventing certain cancers or, for example, for the treatment of uh, fatty liver disease. So we're, I mean, these are tough experiments to do at, uh, in the lab, but we're, we're hoping to do them soon. Yeah. Okay, going back to the chat room, Dr. Richard 
Dixon asks, um, do SAM and STL CoA act as regulators um, through functioning as substrates for protein modifications, or are they possibly ligands in this regulation? Yeah, no, that's a that's a very good question. Um, like, if you were to sense <laughs> these metabolites, how would you do it? And I would say the majority of the evidence we've accumulated in my lab so far suggests they are sensed through uh, their their role as substrates for these uh, protein modifications. Um, it doesn't rule out the possibility that they could be uh, sensed directly. Um, uh, as one example, I think. Uh, David Sabatini's lab has uh, uh, identified a SAM sensor called SAMTOR. They think uh, binds SAM uh, directly. But the overwhelming amount of evidence from our lab suggests it's through these uh, uh, PTMs on, on proteins. So they're very special ones. And I, as I was trying to explain at the talk, I think to really understand acetylation or, or methylation, you've got to think about links to uh, the metabolic state in terms of acetyl-CoA or SAM. I'd like to ask one more um, question, if you don't mind, Ben. The, you tied a lot of this work to um, sort of oxygen metabolism, if you will, which I guess largely involves some mitochondria. Are there similar controls by which metabolites feed back, if you will, or feed forward and regulate mitochondrial metabolism? Yeah, 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 no, 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 for sure. Um, you know, just in thinking about um, osteo-CoA, uh, you could imagine that uh, although what we're measuring are sort of bulk levels of the metabolite, you can imagine there's got to be some very interesting compartmentalization going on because, as we all know, um, osteo-CoA has to uh, sort of feed into the TCA cycle for ATP, and when you oxidize fats, <laughs> that happens in the mitochondria, and so so that. This acetylcholine has to be now channeled uh, into the mitochondria instead of being, for example, in the cytosol or the nucleus where you have fat synthesis or, or gene activation going on, right? So I think it's very dynamic. And likewise, I think for, uh, for SAM and methionine, uh, you know, sulfur is such a fundamental uh, a nutrient or, or key to life. And, you know, in the mitochondria, you have uh, also, methyltransferase enzymes. You've got iron sulfur cluster proteins that, uh, where the sulfur comes from, you know, methionine or cysteine. And so, I'm sure there's a ton of interesting things going on. And who gets the priority under stressful conditions? And uh, you know, we we hope to uh, figure out some of these mechanisms uh, over time. So you started out your scientific career in Dr. Weissman's laboratory at UCSF studying protein folding. Have you gone back to that um, in your metabolism studies? Are there effects, in other words, are there effects of metabolites on protein folding in the cell? Oh yeah, it's actually a really good question. So uh, yeah, no, it's, it's cool. I, I actually have an undergrad uh, in the lab. Uh, she, she's basically uh, taken an off year uh, uh, due to COVID, and um, her project is to examine what happens to the UPR or the unfolded protein response under conditions of, uh, for example, methionine or sulfur starvation. We all know that you know proteins that are secreted or that, that traverse the secretory pathway. You know that's one third of all proteins, and many of them have uh, cysteines and disulfide bonds. And so what happens under conditions of sulfur stress to the UPR? <laughs> so I think there could be some additional, very cool regulation going on. And so she's made some cool observations so far. And I think we may have another project for the future to study the UPR regulation under uh, conditions of sulfur starvation. Wow. Fantastic. Well, um, to conclude then, Ben, thanks very much um, for um, delivering a fan, uh, fantastic lecture this morning and congratulations on winning the 2021 O'Donnell Science Prize. Certainly sounds like there'll be a lot more coming out of the two laboratory and we look forward to um, uh, reading and hearing about that. Uh, I'll turn the podium over now to Christine who will close us out. Christine. Great, thank you. Let's get this. One moment. <laughs>
Here we go. Thank you, uh, Dr. Russell and Dr. Tu for presenting today and also the attendees for joining us. Video and slides of today's session will be posted on the TAMIS website and included in a follow-up email. A survey will be available at the end of the session for attendees to submit feedback. Please join us for our next session on March 10th, where we'll hear from Dr. Christian Davies from Shell International Exploration and Production Incorporation and recipient of the 2021 O'Donnell Award in Technology Innovation on his research. TAMIS member Ann Sal uh, Dr. Ann Salomon from Roll Call Industries LLC will moderate the session. Nominations are now open for the 2022 O'Donnell Awards information, uh, excuse me, 2022 O'Donnell Awards. Information about the awards, including the nomination process is available on our website at tamis.org. A link to the awards nomination page will be included in the follow-up email sent to all of today's attendees. We encourage you to review the information and nominate the next class of rising star researchers in Texas. For those interested in nominating a candidate, we'll have an informational session on March 25th for you to learn more about the process and have the opportunity to ask questions before submitting your nominations. Nominations close April 30th. This concludes our session today and thank you very much.